Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Dies, you tried to get into the Isn't locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to get do the dead come back, today, Mother? What's the secret? The Men in the Snow by Alex Boast Children grow up when they realize that one day they must watch their heroes die. I, for one, understood this from the start. Allow me to tell you the story of the men in the snow. They came in steps, then strides. Mother brought us to the new house on a bitter November morning. As we sat round the kitchen table, watching the fog roll past through the thin glass windows, she told me we would be safe here. Father simply read his newspaper a distance away from us, his spectacled face never leaving the pages. I remember in great detail the childish glee I experienced as I walked, ran and swam through the gardens, fields, woods and lakes near my new country home, paying a special attention to the small stream that trickled close to the house where I would often catch newts to serve as my only friends. I also remember in great detail the extreme cold even in hotter summer months, the invading winter fog seemed never to leave the place and left my limbs encased in a chill wind all year round. I had not wanted to come to the country, but the increased bombings had necessitated a move. Father became even more distant as a result. Mother was catatonic. We'd left our lives in London. Almost immediately upon arrival, I set about finding my own form of entertainment. What else was a young and spoilt girl to do devoid of her applications? The house was as gaunt and barren as my father and mother, so I sought solace in the frog pond, situated in a small alcove, set apart from the stream in the garden. Mother would often have to retrieve me from the freezing cold, counting frogs, chasing water boatmen, lest I perish in the merciless winds. Tea and cake were to be followed by a swift retreat to bed, as ever. Of course, Mother had never known that I simply must have a glass of water within reach of my sleeping arrangement, and as such, I would have to creep back down to the kitchen to retrieve one, perched on the tips of my cold toes so as not to make a noise on the unreliable wooden stairs I would have to descend. The day had been like any other, but this particular evening was defined by a strange happening, one that had never occurred before in the many other nights spent in the looming country house. As I stood still on tiptoes in order to reach the sink, filling my glass with cloudy water from a tap showing clear signs of ageing, I noticed a figure in the garden through the pale glass. This creature was some ways away and situated near a large tree, the only sort of landmark I recall being in view, underneath it on the right-hand side, and wondered, perhaps, if I'd spotted the heron standing forlorn in the dark, having failed to catch its evening meal. Sure enough, this was no heron, but a man, standing resolutely in the beginnings of the winter snow, and flinching in the bitter air. Of course I fled this sight, having remembered the nurturing comfort of my cotton blankets, and the relative safety of my small cot bed and my small cot room. I left the water on the work surface. The following morning, I resolved to bother father about our visitor, for I was an inquisitive child from the city, quite unused to this awful jungle and its lack of crowds, its lack of anyone at all. I beseeched my father to look up from his paper and pay me heed time and time again to no avail, and mother simply looked at me as though I was very wrong to disturb him, simply a child possessed of some girly notion of boys in the garden. At mother's behest, I went to play outside, and I stayed there until nightfall. Upon re-entry to the house, a tiny sanctuary of warmth and hope, my hands and feet turned a shocking purple, and I gazed upon them for a time, pondering why I felt nothing. Mother and father were in the kitchen, and I stared at them whilst they stared at each other. It occurred to me for the first time that they might not be happy. And so, as I became increasingly ignored within this large, empty space, I invented a friend. He was dreadfully shy, though, and would only stand at the end of the garden, by the large tree on its right side. The next night, he had taken a step closer, and the night after that, he had brought a friend. Perhaps he had wanted company, I don't blame him, 
We had no interaction besides distant, vacant stares. I watched them take a step closer in unison, their feet disappearing into the snow. They must have been about fifty paces from the house, straining my vision as much as I could. I could not make out much of their shadowed forms. I wanted so awfully to run to my friends and greet them, but in honesty, I was as shy as they. If they came much closer, Mother would surely invite them in for a cup of tea, or maybe, if they introduced themselves, I would. I resolved to wait it out until my friends had the bravery to meet me in person. On the third evening of this particular week, nearing Christmas time, I think, the snow was growing heavy, and it was with some surprise that as I was filling my glass of water at the sink, I looked up and out of the pale pane that overlooked our garden to discover my friend had made yet another accomplice. I watched as the three of them took a step closer, in perfect unison, shadowed hands clasped together. Something about this movement caused me to feel uneasy, and I retreated to bed, where I slept. Oh, how I slept. On the seventh day, I had finished my usual activities, which included reading a particularly interesting colouring book about English mammals of the Mustelid family, and was ready to head to bed. It occurred to me that Father was still sat with his paper in the kitchen, he rarely moved. When was the last time I had seen Mother? On this particular evening, as the snow billowed down, blanketing the world in its cold venom, I remembered my glass of water before heading upstairs, only to have to sneak back down. I had taken little notice of my friends in the snow, deeming them unworthy of my friendship. But on this, the seventh day, I looked up, out of the glass that caught my breath and steamed immediately. Once it had cleared, I saw seven figures in the garden. They had moved closer. They were not boys at all, but grown men, and their shadowy forms jittered and twitched as they took a single step towards me in my home. No longer were they in unison, they ambled and shuffled forwards like the drunken men I had once seen at Father's Working Men's Club. Something about their fall from grace, their solidifying escape from fluidity, utterly unnerved me, and I strained on the very tips of my toes to reach for the blinds and pull them somewhat satisfyingly closed, locking the monsters from view, because no, I did not like these new men at all. I had created them, and I could hide them away behind those flimsy paper blinds. We did not open them again. After a fretful night, in which I did not sleep one wink, life continued as well not quite normal. Something had changed Mother. Had she seen the men too? If this was the case, she certainly didn't make it known. In fact, she very rarely spoke at all now, only to tell me to stop shaking and call me for tea, but lacking the energy she once had. Father, as ever, sat by the window with his paper. I wondered if Mother stopped speaking to me at all how I would survive, Whilst I did know she kept the bread in the small container next to the fridge situated on the left of the large window, next to several storage cupboards, I did not know how to make anything as impressive as mashed potato. What could it matter, though, considering I had lost all appetite? The very house seemed to be mocking me. It was getting smaller, its hallway lengthening, the small flight of unruly stairs I had mastered. I could even reach the cord to open it. Stop shaking, darling, she says. And with that, I fled to bed, tummy growling and dreamt of a thousand eels writhing together, trapped in a wooden barrel fit to burst. The sun had been fighting a losing war with the moon and would illuminate the snowy fields around our land for only a few hours a day. I was dismayed to discover my frog pond had frozen over, minute friends likely trapped in tiny cold prisons. I spent some time clawing at the frozen surface of my amphibian friend's home, hoping that my efforts might thaw me a new plaything, but I was gravely mistaken, and as I felt a shadow cast itself over my back, I turned to witness the sun set behind that tall, lonely tree. A peal of thunder tore through the pallid sky and sent a new chill through me. I wanted desperately to flee to my bed, but couldn't tear my eyes from what I saw. From behind the tree, spilling like eels from a barrel, some forty-nine bodies invaded my eyesight, falling over each other and clambering to their feet, 
I watched wide-eyed, breath billowing in the cold air as they organised rank and file before me in one great line, illuminated in the desperate light of the moon. They were ever so close now, and as they shuffled, I turned and ran. Ran not to mother or to father, but to my small cot bed in my small cot room, where I slept and dreamt of great engines and spinning wheels like the kinds I had seen on the automobiles back in London. I dreamt I had wings. Oh, how I dreamt and slept and dreamt ever more, soaring in the snowy clouds. I know not whether I slept through the next day, or whether the sun had simply given in and admitted defeat. I doubted it was even there behind the clouds. For me, it no longer existed. On trembling legs I stood in my small cot room and reached for my night lamp, the only current source of illumination. It travelled with me down to the kitchen where my cold throat begging for warming moisture might be sated. Father had, for the first time in my knowing memory, moved from his vigil, leaving only his paper on the work surface. I moved to look at it, but my thirst could not wait. As I stood no longer on tiptoes, filling my small glass with cloudy water, a curious sensation overcame me, and I reached with long and spindly fingers for the cord to the blinds, the cord I could now reach. I would lift it, ever so slightly, and just peek. I speak to you now with tear-filled eyes, dear listener, and I swear to you I tell no lies. Inveiled to me by the sickly light of my lamp behind that flimsy, skin-like blind, were two hundred angry eyes, raw and hate-filled eyes, yellow and throbbing, the skin around them blistered and caked with the unknown. I could hear the moans of the dying fill not my ears but my eyes as I understood the chilling truth. Observe the hairs on my arms raise as I narrate this to you, and I snatched for father's paper. It was a London publication. The headline ran, December 1940, 100 English servicemen killed by Nazi bombings. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked room today, didn't you? You tried to How get do the dead come, come back, Mother? Didn't you? What's the secret? So that was The Men in the Snow by Alex Boast. Now, normally, at this time, I tell you something about when the author was born and when he died. But in fact, this author's still alive and I managed to interview him. So I'm really excited that we're going to have a bit of a chat, me and Alex, and he's going to talk about his story and his influences. This is just an opportunity to say that, you know, every now and again, I would really like to feature the, a ghost story by a living author. So if you've got one, get in touch with us via the Facebook, Classic Ghost Stories Facebook page, and uh, we'll, we'll arrange something, and uh, that'll be really good. But for now, here is the author of the story we just read, Alex Boast. Alex Boast. So, hello, Alex. Well, it's really great to have you here. One of our few living authors. Most of the people we read out are actually dead. Not yet. No, it's nice that you're alive. <laughs> so, we just read your story, The Men in the Snow, and I would just like you, first of all, because this is what I would do with a dead author, I would say something about them biographically. So tell me something about yourself. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm a British writer. You know, I've been living in London uh, for the, the better part of the last decade, but I was born in Ipswich and grew up in Surrey, hence the sort of posh boy accent. Um, but I, I knew, you know, I spent all my time when I was a kid reading Greek and Roman myths, ghost stories, things like that. And I, I just sort of thought, you know what, I've got to have a go one day. Uh, I want to be a writer. I've always wanted to be a writer. Now I'm, I'm sort of getting towards being one. <laughs> I, I don't feel like I can say really that I am one yet, but I'm certainly sort of doing my best. That, that's imposter syndrome, isn't it? Is it though? Right? All writers think that. I think Neil Gaiman and uh, Stephen King still Yeah, I'm that. sure they do. And they're brilliant, aren't they? Um, but I'm very excited because I'm writing more than ever. And I can definitely see the progress that's been made. But I can also see the mountain still to climb. 
so I kind of did short stories as, mm. um, you know, I've got an MA in creative writing and a, a lot of that was around F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and people that were really good at short stories. And Stephen King is very good at short stories, right? So mm. I sort of thought, what a great place to start. I can I can learn about ghost stories and writing by doing shorts, build up an audience and then move towards the novel. Why do you want to be a novelist? Because there's a story and there's always been a story for me. It's, it's, mm. it's, it walked into my head when I was a teenager and it never walked back out again. So until I exercise that demon, mm. it's... I've got it. It's something that's got to be done. I've done one of three. There's going to be three. Okay. Um, and the first, the first is finished. Um, but I keep going back to it as a kind of comfort <laughs> or kind of safety blanket. I always look at one when I should be right working on two and three. Right. Uh, it's an issue I have, but very much I can see uh, there's going to be this universe what my characters are going to live in. There's going to be songs. There's going to be short stories. There's going to be the three novels. So you're doing a lot of world building, uh, things that will will just form the background, but won't actually be necessarily spelled out in the books. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's about inheritance and about uh, you know moving on is a big theme in any ghost story. Yeah, and and it certainly is in in my novels. And the the kind of the twist, if you like, is if we don't live up to our potential, do we become a ghost of ourselves? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, do we, do we haunt ourselves with who we might have been? Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting question for modern society. And that's what we're going to explore in these three books. Wow, that sounds good. Thank you. So tell me about this particular story, The Men in the Snow. How, how did it happen? So I, this is my first foray post master's degree into writing short stories and it's not connected to my novels in any way my short stories live in a different universe yeah and then my novels live in a separate universe but the men in the snow uh i wanted to write as an exercise uh the voice of a little girl mm. and i like very much that sort of narrative mm. frame of she is telling the story you know she's survived and now she's she's telling the story to others almost around the campfire but that that's a classic, isn't it? That's a classic ghost story. Um, you know, M.R. James does that and uh, uh, E.F. Benson and people like that. This happened to me and then they tell the story. So it's a very classic frame. It is. It's rarely a woman. Yeah, it's true. And it's rarely from a childhood perspective. So I, I like trying to see uh, – there's some behavioral psychology in there. You know, there's, is this – narrator reliable mm. is this the imagination running wild you know she talks about her dreams and how she dreams of the eels the eels in the barrel they kind of represent fear and her feelings okay and so we're sort of thinking oh you know this is interesting what was, was she seeing these ghosts um and then you get to the climax of the story and you're like oh wow okay people did die so maybe it's really down to us, right? I was going to ask about the, the house gets smaller towards the end. Yes. And when that happened, I, I, I think I mentioned before we, we came on air or that um, it reminded me of House of Leaves. Oh, yeah. Uh, at, which is a very strange house where if people don't know it, they should go out and buy it. So I've got that hard book, the big heavy weighty tome behind me. <laughs> it's a great book. Okay. No, it's great. And the way that... They delve into the house, and the house grows uh, mysteriously, and, and that and that was an echo. But is that what was happening, or was it? Yes. So it was her growing. It was her getting older, mm. um, and that's represented by the fact that she can reach the blinds um, later on because she starts off too short, and she can't, you know, she can't really do stuff for herself. And then she's mm. she's kind of growing up on her own, so she's invented these friends for herself. So she thinks, mm. but they might be real. You know, and I wanted to um, capture more about her and and kind of the way the world reflects itself to her uh, uh, and how she might be feeling. Uh, and the parents, the parents are really just plot devices, you know. That well, the parents were weird. I thought the parents were quite, and that was um, the dad who just sits in the kitchen reading the newspaper. 
And I had this image of him sitting there at midnight and 3 a.m. just sitting there with the newspaper. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's awful, isn't it? It's horrible. It, it makes me really deeply upset uh, to think about. A lot of my stories do, actually. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm saying. Um, yeah, so the, the dad could be a ghost himself, right? The, every, almost everyone could be a ghost. And, and that is often a theme is who who is alive who is not are they all ghosts if they are how do they move on this is the first story so there's not much of that moving on theme there's more the shock horror factor so you've just said and i hadn't realized that but now now you say it's not that sixth sense moment at the end when you think oh my god they were all dead he was dead you know yeah uh where where the mother at one point she says where is where is mother you know, as if mother has vanished or something. They're gone. Yeah, they're gone. But th- that was the Robert Ake. And I was, I said this to you, I think that, um, as well as House of the Leaves, because I think you inevitably, when you, you read a story, you're kind of cataloging it against other writers and other. Yeah, that's a great compliment. Yeah, yeah but, I, but the weirdness, the, the, the just Aikman to me is like a real life shifted slightly to a weird place. Um, I think, of, uh, was it ringing, ringing the changes? where they go and stay in that hotel, him and his wife. And it's very modern sort of 1960s-y, dismal provincial town, but just shifted into the weird side of things. And and this, so whereas your story is realistic in that, it, you know, it, there are newts in it and a pond and the war. Yeah. It's also unnervingly odd if you don't mind me saying yeah it heads into uncanny valley for sure it, it it's definitely a perversion a corruption of you know these these men the, the men in the snow were were soldiers they were heroes they were great they were great guys and they've turned into something sinister and something frightening why is that do you think because they died in anger because they they died in in, in horrible wartime circumstances you know Oh, you do say about the angry eyes, in fact. Yeah, I remember that now. That's right. Yeah, they're kind of raging against the machine in that regard. You know, to, to be a soldier and to be blown up and not see the guy that killed you and stuff. That You know, in, in, in Japanese and Eastern mythology and, and ghost stories, well, that's called a juyon or a, or a grudge. When you, when you die really emotionally and angrily, it creates this, this awful... Uh, uh, kind of presence or, or ghost. Is that, you know, there's a horror movie called The Grudge, isn't there? That's exactly it. Yeah, that is it. Uh, so that's what I was thinking was it's not the girl's fault. She's a victim of circumstances. She's going to be so terrified by her encounters. Um, but she does live to tell the tale. But there is there is absolutely a message in there, you know? Yeah. No, it was it was a really good story. I really liked reading it. And Thank you. When you're reading somebody's story, you're always like, oh, I wonder if I like it. But it was very fortunate that I did, and I thought it was really good. Uh, I'm really glad to hear that. It's one of my favorites. It's just that unnervingness as well, you know. (laughs) In general, when you're writing this kind of story, what what are your influences? We talked a little bit about Robert Aikman and people like that, who I mentioned, in fact, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I read really widely. Uh, you know, you know when Me Before You came out, I've read all three of those books by JJ Moyes. I, I thought they were brilliant. So that is a good example of I'll go off and read a totally different genre and love it. Um, I would love very much to write comedy. I would love to write romance. I, I fall back on the ghost story and and the uncanny because um, Lovecraft was huge for me. Stephen King was huge for me. Uh, Chuck Palahniuk. I never know if I pronounce that right. Nor me. But I know <laughs> who you mean. Right? Fight yeah. club and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to be honest, my two biggest influences really, and this never comes across in my writing at all, is J.R.R. Tolkien uh-huh. and Frank Herbert, who did Dune, the sci-fi series. Yeah. Well, the Tolkien stuff, I suppose, when we're talking about the world building and you were talking earlier on about uh, having a world with stories and it has a cultural background, very, that's very Tolkien-esque, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. That's true. I do do a lot of writing about Tolkien on Cora uh, website. I'm, I'm quite active on. There's a, a later ghost story called The Dark Arm uh, about a. He's an orphan boy in London. He's a butcher's apprentice, and the only time he's ever felt at home was when he goes to church. But there's this great mystery in the church that he has to kind of uncover. 
and there's great violence there and great fear and he has to try to fix it with love <laughs> and i i love that kind of theme and i think some some writers yeah will do that but it's often force of arms isn't it it's it's i'm going to be stronger than you uh you know kind of have more positive emotions and win that way well that's interesting that is interesting yeah because as you say it's usually the the protagonist is the uh well in the action movie world is the toughest isn't it mm. yeah. well that's why harry potter is so good that's very emotional yeah there's a lot of love in that there's ghosts in that too uh but it's all about overcoming adversity through um kind of empathy and compassion and I really like that in a ghost story. But I'm very interested in some of your other projects that you were talking to me about before. So tell me what else you've got going at the moment. Okay, so I, uh, I was lucky enough to go on an Arvon course last October. I'll give them a, a nice little plug, the, the, the charity. So they're the, the writing foundation, yeah. Yeah, really fantastic. They did their first ghost story writing course that I one day would like to teach. And I thought, what better way to begin that relationship than go as a student? I'd like to go on it myself. Now, I mean, I didn't know about it yet, but I, I'm going to look out for that. It's so good. It was brilliant. So last Halloween, I was in a barn, like a converted barn with a bunch of other writers, writing ghost stories oh. and drinking organic white wine from the farm <laughs> next door. Yeah. It was astonishing. Yeah. And I had this really transformative conversation with the teacher, a woman called Natasha Pulley, who's a, a very established writer of ghost stories mm. in her own right. Um, and she, she said something so brilliant, it changed everything about my novel. And my novel is now three, three novels. Um, it was always going to be two, but it's now three. Okay. And what we've done is we've changed the tile. So the new one is going to try to really capture the, the theme in the title so that the new title is now the threat of hope mm -hmm. right and the reason it's called that is because the status quo for the character he's very sad mm. he's an angry young man he's alone it's him and the dog against the world uh, he meets a woman and she threatens that status quo by loving him mm. and to him that's very frightening that's very concerning mm. uh, and it kind of really is threatening to him and he, the fact that he might be happy at some point is so kind of alien <laughs> that he kind of runs away from it because he's accustomed to being sad. Okay. And so he kind of inherits this mantle, this kind of destiny to um, help others achieve their own potential at the loss of his own. Um, and then he, he's going to have a son who is the character in the second novel. And then the third novel is an interquel where the girlfriend from the first novel becomes the mother in the second, and she has her own arc as well. Okay. And that's called Skeptic's Lament. And the reason for that is she says to the boys, the dad and the son, that she doesn't believe. Mm. She doesn't believe in the ghosts. But she does, and she always has, and we're going to find out why. So now we've got this whole, you know, really massively character-driven trilogy mm. of ghost stories in the same universe. So that's, for me, that's hugely exciting because that's my stuff, right? That's me. That's that exposed. And you're doing a lot of writing at the moment, are you saying? That's right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm writing for other people, which is, is nice. So I, I write a lot online. I help other writers. I mentor people. Um, I've actually very excitingly signed a contract to write a horror movie based on Irish folklore. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Really cool. Where, tell me more about that. So that's fantastic. That, that, that was actually a, a very passionate young man who is a sort of entrepreneur, founder type person. He's, he's from Irish heritage and uh, he has a grandmother who had been sort of regaling him with stories of the Banshee. Yeah, the howl of the Banshee, absolutely. And we don't like the Banshee. The Banshee's scary. Yeah. <laughs> so he would like very much to explore that in a in a film yep yeah uh to the tune of you know you know it was redone recently it was very good uh insidious was 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 pretty mm -hmm. decent modern horror story uh he wants to have a go at one of those and uh, he he sort of went out to look for writers and he said he had a short list of 30 uh and this is really sad i, I hope you won't mind me saying this um he said of the 30 sort of 28 29 
were sort of quite interested in, oh, well, how much is it going to pay? And I'm, I'm quite busy. Okay. And I yeah. sort of said, oh, my God, I would love to do that. Um, I'm not even, you know, you can pay me at the end if you're happy. I don't want to accept anything if you, if you don't like what I've done. Mm. Uh, so we got on really, really well. He's quite pleased. Um, so I, I've committed to having the script uh, in three months. Wow. And it's, it's, it's quite mature already. Okay. Uh, and I'm really, really excited. I've done some, I don't know if you've heard of Masterclass, but I've done some Masterclasses in screenwriting. I've just finished Aaron Sorkin's one on screenwriting. Um, and I did a lot in my MA, but that was a little while back, so I'm a bit rusty. Mm. But I'm really excited about this. Um, and I think this could lead to other good things. And then I'm working on an album of uh, acoustic songs that will tie into my novels as well and could potentially do for the film. So how do you find time to do anything else? <laughs> I've got all the time in the world. I'm the least busy person I know. You know if you need any help, Tony, please let me know because I've got time. Um, but, yeah, I mean, recently I lost my job, which is unfortunate. And that was due to the, the current situation, was it? I'm afraid so, yeah. I was in global management for a health company and spending literally 50% of my time traveling, a lot of time in Costa Rica and Sweden. And uh, if you can't travel... You can't do the job. You, ca you can't move. You can't work. They're not going to keep you on. They're not going to pay you. I understand that. I appreciate that. It's a shame because we were trying to help women, uh, which is something quite important to me. But, you know, it hasn't worked out. Um, yeah. Thankfully, it paid very well, so I've got a few quid. But, <laughs> no, I'm really excited. And I love I, – I, I would love some more reviews. I love selling books. I've been so lucky and so privileged in the past that people are very complimentary and very kind about my stories, um, which is really nice. I think if, if people have been nice about your stories, that must mean that they're pretty good. I hope so. I really hope so. I, I loved every second of writing them. They're, they're hugely emotional for me. There is one that's about love, um, which is one of my favorites. Uh, and, and there's a really nice cover for that one. It's called The Cracks in the Statue. And the, the, the theory is, you know, you can see a really beautiful statue, but you go up close and you have a look. And if you're looking for flaws, you're going to find them. That's the theme of that collection. But yeah, they're all on Amazon. Um, I'm thinking about experimenting with audio versions and paperback versions and things. I think you should, you definitely, uh, the paperback, uh, um, my own experience is the paperback sell. If you're actually doing live events and you've got them in your hand, they sell. But um, audio, definitely, there's a growing market for audio. So I'd encourage you to do that. Yeah, I would love to do that. Like, for instance, I've really enjoyed this. Um, this feels nice. It, it feels good. And I'd like to do this more. Um, cause I, I like all sort of m forms of media. You know, I love, I love my covers. I love imagery as well. And it's just really exciting. It, it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of trying my best to be really passionate about it. And I, I think I genuinely am. <laughs> I think you, you sound it. You sound it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, on Amazon, I have a website as well, ghoststorywriter.co.uk where there's a little blog and some updates and things. I'm on Quora and Medium and LinkedIn. And also, if anyone's listening that wants help um, or, or needs some tutelage or some mentoring, if I don't know how to help you myself, I'll know other writers, please get in touch because uh, we'll help each other. And the best way is through your website, is it? Yeah, probably. That's, yeah, I think that's probably the best, best way to go. So just, just tell us what that was again so that people catch it a second time. So it's ghoststorywriter.uk. Fantastic. Okay, well, it's been lovely talking to you, and I've really enjoyed reading your story, and I know people will enjoy listening to it. Thank you so much, Tony. You did a great job. You've got a beautiful voice. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, so... <laughs> I look forward to hearing it. All right, cheers. Fantastic. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much, Tony. Cheers, mate. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?